Is it time for you to get involved in your local design scene? Who could you help? What benefits could you see for your own work? Maybe you want to start an event of your own. Well, in this interview with Luke Tong, the co-founder of Birmingham Design Festival, we're going to discover what it takes to start and run an event that has quickly become one of the most recognised in the UK and Europe. Luke's going to share his journey from the initial ideas to hosting some of the world's biggest names in design, as well as his own 15-year career in design, working with agencies on some global brands before starting freelancing for himself. Luke is also a visiting tutor at Birmingham City University, and you're going to discover his passion for the design community in this conversation with Luke Tom. Hi, Luke. Thanks so much, mate, for joining us and hanging out today. Hey Matt, good to be with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Could you give us a little bit of context for people who don't know you? Maybe like one minute of your career, maybe from where you studied and just some of the the things you've done, whether you've been in-house agency, what kind of projects you've worked on. Yeah, of course. So uh, I studied graphic design at Falmouth in Cornwall for three years in the early 2000s now, which is a scary thought, long time ago. Um, I then did 10 years in industry at two relatively big agencies um, outside of London, so opted to not go and do the London thing, but um, worked it in the Midlands. So was at my first agency for three years and then moved over to Birmingham where I met my wife and settled uh, and did seven years there, rising to become a senior designer. And then I realized that industry and agency kind of life wasn't what was going to make me the happiest. I'd been doing quite a lot of freelance during those years, been working on magazines uh, and smaller kind of independent jobs that were keeping me a lot happier. So I made the leap and went freelance. I also was invited to start lecturing at that time. So kind of jumped out of one world into another very different one, which was, you know, being my own boss, juggling various side projects and doing a bit of lecturing. So I've been doing that kind of mixture of things for the last five years now. Um, So kind of 15 years into my career with that rough kind of 10 year agency, five year independent kind of break. Great. So five years freelancing now. Yeah, it's flown by. I I keep telling people it's like two years or three years, but it it is nearer five. That's because of the pandemic. I guess so. Yeah, (laughs) everything was last year that was actually three years ago. Right. So what kind of areas do you do you specialize in and, and focus on as a, a designer? I, I want to focus in this in this conversation on um, you work with the design festival, but I just think this context yeah. is really helpful. Sure. Yeah. So it, it definitely has kind of the, everything that I do informs everything else that I do. So there's always links and connections there. Um, so probably three quarters of my time is spent working on brand. And that's usually brand identity, brand language, uh, brand communications, working with a range of you know, smaller startups, charities, third sector clients through to much bigger um, blue chip kind of household names. And then the rest of it is editorial. So that's really where my heart is in design, but those projects don't come around as often as the brand work. So there's kind of a really nice mixture there of maybe a third, two thirds or three quarters, one quarter. Um, So yeah, I try and I try and say no to anything that isn't those things because they're what make me happiest. And that's where I I think I do my best work. And then as you say, Kind of all of the event stuff runs alongside and on top of that but i obviously managed to bring a lot of that brand and editorial work into those things because again that's where i'm happiest yeah very smart yeah i, I really know you for your editorial design some mm. really expressive layouts really interesting use of type and color we'll show some of your work um here because right. it, it really helps people have a a little bit of context but a, a few years ago you co-founded Birmingham Design Festival and I think this is really interesting for maybe people nowadays we're all we're all siloed you know I I have a studio here but you know I'm kind of here by myself most of the time and and we work remotely a lot and the encouragement to to get involved and do things um, in the design community in person as well so what for you was the the impetus to to start Birmingham Design Festival? Mm. That's a great question. Um, I think I've always been drawn to community. I I like to talk to my students about the design community rather than the design industry. I think it's a very communal and connected world, as you know, like we were talking before about how everyone seems to know everyone within design. There's kind of, you know, there's a lot of people in design, but also it's a very connected and interconnected Mm. and interdependent world, um, you know, sector industry. And I think that's what I love about it, that although you can work on your own independently, there's a lot of 
community driven um, aspects to what we do, whether that's, you know, we, we work for other people, we work with other people, there's often commissioning and collaborating. So I think that kind of human side of it is really crucial. Um, it's certainly what makes me happiest, um, whether that's kind of learning from other people or helping teach other people or, you know, collaborating with other people. So I'd been kind of plowing my own furrow within community. I used to write and was part of a, a design website called Form 55 that was quite big in the 2000s, I guess, and uh, the noughties. And then um, I'd started kind of dipping my toe. I'm, I'm quite a shy person in person. It may not seem that way from people that know me from being on the stage at things, but yeah, I was quite a reluctant uh, events person. And it took really meeting a group of other people in my local area who were very passionate about events and community to, I was invited to start speaking at things, which I said yes to, despite not really wanting to, um, realizing that it was probably a good thing for me to do to help me kind of get over my shyness. And yeah, that just one thing led to another. I met a really fantastic guy called Dan, who's my collaborator in most of these things. He has a very different skill set to me. He's much more digitally literate and digitally minded. Uh, so we realized we'd got a really good kind of skills mix between us. And those years of maybe 10 years or so of writing about other people's work and making industry connections, that suddenly paid dividends because I had this big book of connections of people that I could say, hello, Mr. Famous Designer, would you come and speak at my design event? So yeah, it, it kind of, it, in retrospect, it looks very simple and like quite a linear path, but actually there was a lot of things that we were both individually doing that kind of led to being able to set up and run design events together. That said, you know, anyone can give it a go. I think that's what I love about community and, and events within the creative industries is that you don't need any real training. You just need to have your heart in the right place and a desire to, you know, get together with people to share, whether that's kind of sharing insights, sharing time together, supporting each other. So yeah, big or small, I'm a big advocate for design events um, and creative community. I think it's really important just that will be some helpful context you mentioned some of the people you've had uh, speak at the festival who are who are some of the the names that maybe an audience on youtube might know that have been to yeah. Birmingham design festival great question um so we were very fortunate in our first year in 2018 we had aaron draplin fly over and, and join us he was obviously a fantastic speaker to have in our first year um we try and have a real mixture of household names within the design industry and then people that maybe haven't had that platform before so each year we have 70 to 100 speakers so you know you can fit a lot of a lot of household names and a lot of newer first timers within that um so we've had anthony burrell rajane dalbello um astrid stavro jack rennick craig oldham jim sutherland they were all in our first year so you know lots of very well established and well-known british designers mm. uh, and and some international uh, we had chris doe of the future fly in for our second year in 2019 which was fantastic um Wes O'Hare, who's designer at Dropbox, and oh gosh, yeah. I mean, each year we tend to fly in maybe five to ten international guests, and there'll be people that you probably won't have been able to hear speak in the UK, which obviously is a big reason for people to come to us. But then we have, you know, all kinds of uh, lesser known and slightly more left field. We had a guy who builds pianos come and speak in 2019. You know, all, all kinds of people that maybe you wouldn't be exposed to if you were just going to a UX conference or just going to a you know design meetup somewhere. So we try and keep things very broad. We have quite a, a broad set of disciplines that we cover within the festival. So that okay. means that you might come to hear an Anthony Burrell or a Google Design or Sony or Adobe or whoever, but then you will stay and you'll discover lots of other speakers that maybe you know, work in a very different area of industry to what you're used to, whether that's kind of more traditional craft-based things or animation or illustration or any of those kind of things so yeah a very broad church yeah this is much broader than graphic design classically yeah. so yeah just give us a quick overview what disciplines have you gathered and sort of invited sure. into that space yeah yeah so we, we are we we're changing it this year slightly so we we talk about design districts and that's how we split the festival so that just helps people understand you know, if you're broadly interested in digital design, you would head to the digital district and there'll be days of talks there that you can uh, sit through. We this year have four districts. So we have graphic, which is anything kind of traditional print, advertising, branding, etc. We have digital, as I mentioned, so anything that's produced uh, and consumed digitally. We have products, which is anything that's physically made. So that in 
includes things like architecture, fashion, product design, uh, interiors, you name it. And then uh, this year we've added illustration as a separate district because there's so many fantastic illustrators out there. We were kind of struggling to fit them all into graphic, which is where they used to sit. So that we think is going to be a good balance of those four kind of streams that you can, the idea being that you could you could come for a day and you could dip in and out of all four of those because they're all walkable so that, that you know, the physical distance is quite uh, easy to navigate between them and the talks happen on the hour so that you can, you know, you can start in one area and move across to another and then head back and you can kind of have a bit of a picnic of talks. Yeah, very cool. Uh, what sort of differences have you seen this is, made in the city i mean i'm presuming that most people watching this video will be familiar with birmingham given that it's the second largest uh, city in the uk so i would have thought sure. they'd they'd know birmingham or aston villa or canals or s something yeah, about sure, birmingham sure. you know yeah. um all the stereotypes but mm, is, is the blinders. you don't have the accent though that's one thing no, you don't no, sound don't. like a peaky blinder I, i'm not I, i'm what they call an incomer so i was born in the north um maybe not quite as far as north as you matt but i'm i'm from near sheffield originally that's where i was born and grew up uh, and spent my kind of formative years there went off to uni in cornwall headed back and then moved over to birmingham so i've been here 12 or 13 years something like that so yeah i've not quite picked up the accent yet and it's it's you know it, it feels like home i very much feel a part of the city now but it is it is interesting that i do still have that kind of income as i don't have maybe some of the um hang-ups that some of the locals here have because birmingham is you know is a really interesting city it's it's fantastic it's um it's vibrant it's young it's thriving there's an amazing food scene and cultural scene etc but it still sometimes is the butt of the joke I think, you know, people can mock the accent. They can think that there's nothing kind of exciting happening here, which is a real shame that it's kind of had that reputation. So I feel like the work we're doing is partly to prove to people that Birmingham deserves its second city moniker, that, it, you know, it's, it's on the map for good reasons and that there's a really vibrant creative scene here, which we're, you know, really proud to be a part of. Yeah, very cool. Um, what about for you personally? Like, I know... That I've known you for qu quite a long time, you know, maybe 10, yeah. 15 years since we first met. And I know that you're a really uh, generous guy and, and you, you've got that real desire to, you know, help out and, and pay forward, you know, some of the opportunities you've been given. But yeah. I think it's really interesting that when you become involved in something and when you give th things come back to you. So what mm. are some of the benefits that you've you've seen for yourself in, in your own design career through mm. starting events and being involved in them and, and networking in this way? Yeah, that's a great question. It's, it's really hard to quantify. I can't directly link, say, you know, a client work that's come as a direct result of this. I think a lot of what happens is reputational increase or, you know, um, <clears throat> if you build a platform for other people and you get to share a bit of that platform, you end up being seen by more people. So there's an obvious kind of halo effect there of, I suppose I some people will know of my work because of my work and some people will know of my work because of the event side of things so that's you know that's a that's a happy accident i would say most of it is just the joy that comes from knowing that you've done something that's of value and that you you're building something with a community and for other people um meeting your design heroes is not to be underestimated you know or you know undervalued that's a, a fantastic part of why we do what we do and we're really fortunate to have met and made some really good friends with people that you know, they used to be people that I would share their work and write about them. And now they're people who I'm, you know, friends with and they're in my phone. So that's a that's a really lovely byproduct as well. Um, yeah, so I think it's it's myriad. It's not I don't know whether I get more work as a result of that side of things. I certainly give a lot of time away to it. So it's not necessarily very lucrative at the minute. Um, one day it might be. But yeah, I'm I'm very happy that I can. I've achieved a balance. I mean, I don't have a work-life balance uh, down at all, so I'm, I wouldn't pretend that I do. I, you know, I, I work very long and hard. But what I'm, I do is I, I manage to do work that I really enjoy, and that helps pay for my time, so that I can then be free to do community things, which you know don't necessarily pay. So um, yeah, I, I'm much more fulfilled now than I was when I was full time, for instance. Yeah, that makes sense, and just. Like again for our audience like I, I know because we've done a few projects together mm. that you, you've been able to get to this point now where you're a high value designer you know that you, you're worth 
and being able to be charged what you're worth when you are working, you're then freeing up time to be involved in these things and, and it creates more opportunities for you. And I think that's a, it's a, a good thing for people to bear in mind and to aspire to and, and, and to work towards, you know, as the progressing. I'd love, love to hear your advice for two types of people. One, people who are wanting to start an event or a festival or a community or just a meetup or something that's in their city or in their region. And maybe it doesn't feel like there's a lot happening right now. Like what would you be your encouragement to them and, and maybe just like a couple of tips to, to get going? Uh, it's a great question. It's one we get asked quite frequently. Uh, our advice is always to seek out what else is already happening in your area, even if it's maybe not exactly what you would be keen to do, because sometimes that's where you find the people who are also really passionate about community and events and you know are, are doing something. So yeah, looking around and seeing what else is there, don't just jump right in and think a festival is the way to go. You know, we built up to that over a number of years. We had a great skill set and we also had uh, the opportunity in Birmingham where there wasn't that already, but there was kind of an audience and we thought that that could support that. Um, the second thing that I would do is I would start with a smallish meetup which is probably more general. So if you're, you know, if you're specific and you love brand design, it's going to be quite hard to start a brand design meetup in your area, I would think, unless you know that there's a load of people there that were within that niche. It's much easier to start kind of a general arts creative scene meetup for people that are just interested in creativity and you can kind of focus on different things. And as you grow that audience, you may then be able to kind of split off drill down into slightly more niche areas, you know, offshoots can can form that sort of thing. So yeah, I think gather people around you that are really keen and passionate about the things that you're keen and to look at and passionate about. Um, and you just have to go for it at some point, you know, it is quite daunting. You don't know whether people will turn up. You may start very small. I think you have to, you have to have quite good stickability with events and community building because, you know, you know, like building anything, it's, it's very rare that you just build and you have an, an inbuilt audience that will turn up to things. It's one thing being able to kind of get people to watch something online. It's very different to get them to, you know, hop in their car or, you know, get on a bus or train or, and travel and turn up to a physical event, especially now when there's so much great content out there online. So, yeah, think really carefully about what the benefit is that you're giving to people. Obviously, I think there's nothing better than being in a room with people and, you know, face-to-face -face contact, that kind of camaraderie and community spirit is really richest when you're together in a space. So I think that there's still enormous value in getting together, but it does have to be, it has to be a suit suitably inviting and exciting proposition for people to want to come to it. So, you know, you have to think about sponsorship and, you know, maybe a, a, your venue, speaker lineups, all of those kind of things have to kind of work together to give people a reason to, to part with their money and, and to give you their time. But it's, yeah, you, you don't need to have huge ambitions. I think just starting small and seeing where things go, it's best if kind of you go on that journey and that's what takes you somewhere bigger rather than thinking, you know, oh, I'm gonna start something huge because, you know, that, that often can be a disappointing venture if you're not careful. Yeah, so much in there, Luke. Thanks for, for sharing that from your journey. What's happening this year at the festival? Could you give us a little uh, yeah. insight into what we yeah, can expect yeah. this summer? I'd love to. Um, yeah, we, we're very excited to be COVID free, we think, for, for this year after two years of disruption. Obviously, COVID is going to be around. But um, yeah, we, we're back to in-person festivals, which is good. We, in fact, just today we've announced, uh, when we're recording this, we've, we've announced an event called Gather, which is happening in Birmingham in April. This may well have happened by the time people are watching this. Um, but that's going to be a, a launch, kind of a, a pre-festival launch event, if you like. We're launching a magazine and we've got a series of talks from some art directors who are in the magazine world. So that excites me personally because that's very much my niche. Um, and then in June of 2022, we've got the festival. Our theme is freedom for this year, which is obviously quite fitting. Um, we've got 70, 80, 90 speakers confirmed already. We've got some amazing and probably our strongest lineup across the board. Um, we've got some really interesting different events using different venues. Um, so yeah, we're, we're really excited. Uh, tickets aren't going to be on sale until May. Um, and we'll be announcing the full lineup nearer then. So if people just want to, you know, follow our socials, I'm sure they'll be linked somewhere. You can check out 
Birmingham Design Festival and see if it's something that you might be interested in coming to. Our prices are very, very affordable compared to every other big design event. We, we're intentionally very accessible um, and diverse in our lineup. So we hope that, you know, we get people that travel from around the world to be with us, which is amazing. Um, so yeah, fingers crossed, all will go to plan in June and we'll enjoy being together in the room. Yeah, very cool. We'll, we'll put a link in the description to the Thank festival, you. particularly if people in the UK and Europe can uh, check that out and get down to mm -hmm. Birmingham. I'm planning to be there myself. Uh, can, you. can you l reveal, Luke, anybody who's going to be speaking? What? Oh, gosh. Um, we, do, we are doing a speaker drop soon, so some names will already have been announced. Uh, Mr. Bingo is speaking. He's a fantastic illustrator. Morag Myerskoff, who's just been on the, the Big Design Challenge on TV, is speaking. Jay Blades, who is one of the presenters on the repair shop and runs a furniture restoration business, mm. is speaking. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we've got a, an enormous lineup of names. It, it feels unfair to just single some out, but there's there's real kind of quality across the board. There's some really interesting, there's a, a product design, as in a physically built product um, speaker coming over from uh, West Coast of America. Um, yeah, so just a real, real diverse lineup of speakers again, you know, across those disciplines. But um, yeah, it promises to be a really exciting and interesting uh, event this year. Well, thank you so much, mate, for jumping onto this conversation and we can share one of our chats with the world. I really appreciate yeah, it's a it. Pleasure. If people want to find you, where can they find you and connect with you personally? Yeah, absolutely. Um, LukeTong.com, which is uh, T-O-N-G-E, um, and at LukeTong across all the socials, that's usually me. Very cool. Go and find Luke Brilliant. there. Tell him you enjoyed this chat. Yeah, Great. I'd, love, I'd love to connect with some of you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, mate. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Luke. Let us know which bits stuck out to you and if you'd like to see more interviews on the channel. Who would you like to see on here? There are links in the description so you can find Luke and Birmingham Design Festival as well as links to our Fux Academy programs. And until next time, happy designing. Happy designing.